Eventually, due to international pressure and massive internal opposition, the white government began to repel the restrictions on political parties and the media. Finally, on the 26th of April, 1994, the new national flag of the Republic of South Africa was hoisted, making it one of the latest democracies in the world. The apartheid government came to an end, giving way to the formation of a multi-party and multi-racial government. How was it possible? Wouldn't the blacks take revenge for the past injustice? The peaceful transition happened as Nelson Mandela insisted that his countrymen never give up on the belief in human goodness. Accordingly, the native Africans forgave their white rulers and built a new South Africa based on the equality of all races and genders. The white rulers who had ruled oppressively for several decades now sat across the native Africans and drew a constitution based on universal values that promoted democracy, social justice and human rights. After two years of dialogue and deliberation, they came out with one of the finest constitutions in the world. The preamble of the constitution reads as follows. We, the people of South Africa, recognize the injustices of the past, honor those who suffered for justice and freedom in our land, respect those who have worked to build and develop our country, and believe that South Africa belongs to all who live in it, united in our diversity. The South African Constitution inspired democracies all over the world, a state that was until recently denounced as the most undemocratic was now seen as a model of democracy. This was made possible by the determination and humanity of the South African people, who declared that they will never allow a repetition of their racist, brutal and repressive past, and will work towards a progressive change truly shared by all its people, regardless of their race or gender. The South Africans call themselves Rainbow Nation because after apartheid ended, they accommodated people of all colors in their fold. We will follow the example of South Africa to understand why we need a constitution and the various functions of the constitution. As we have seen earlier, the white oppressors and the black majority of South Africa together formed a constitution. This was not an easy task as the black majority wanted to safeguard their interests and wanted substantial social and economic rights. Whereas the white minority wanted to protect its privileges and property. The blacks were also keen on ensuring that the democratic principles of majority rule were not compromised. The blacks and the whites reached a compromise where they took care of the demands and requirements of both parties. The only way to ensure implementation of this agreement was to make some rules which everyone would abide by. This set of basic rules is what we call a constitution. A constitution is the supreme law accepted by all the people of a country. Every country, regardless of being a democracy or a non-democracy, has a constitution. This applies not just to governments, but also to political parties, organizations, cooperative societies and associations. 
all these bodies need a set of written rules which will be followed by everyone involved. Besides being the supreme law, a constitution also determines the relationship between people and their government. A constitution has four primary functions. First, it generates the trust that is necessary for different kinds of people to live together. It also specifies how the government will be constituted or who will have the power and what decisions they would be responsible for. The constitution lays down limitations on the powers of the government and makes the citizens aware of their rights as well. And lastly, it expresses the aspirations of people for building a good society. Did you know one of the earliest written constitutions is the Code of Hammurabi, written 4,000 years ago by the Babylonian king Hammurabi, who ruled the area which is now Iran. This code, written on a stone tablet, is on display in the Louvre Museum in France. Throughout history, people of all free countries have given their subsequent generations a constitution to abide by. Be it the Americans, after winning the war against Great Britain, or the French at the end of their revolution. The story of our constitution is similar to the one in South Africa. India was split into two countries at the time of independence. This was a difficult time for the people of both India and Pakistan. During the partition, over a million people died on both sides. In India, people had just come from being subjects to being citizens of a sovereign nation. Not everything about governing the country was clear at this point. The reason for this was the long years of colonial rule and inexperience in self-governance. This was also evident when Nehru said in his speech that we have realized our dream not wholly but substantially. He said this to indicate that independence was only one part of their dream. A lot more was needed to be done. Another issue was the merging of the princely states with India. However, unlike South Africa, the making of the Indian constitution was much smoother, as much of the agreement about what type of democratic country India should be had developed during the freedom struggle itself. The constitution of India was first drafted by Motilal Nehru and eight other Congress workers in 1928. This was done again in 1931 at the Karachi session where the outline of the Indian constitution was discussed. Both these documents were committed to universal adult franchise, the right to freedom and equality and safeguarding the rights of the minorities. So, our leaders were very clear about the basic ideas of the constitution and the arrangements during colonial rule further helped them familiarize themselves with the same. Mahatma Gandhi was not a part of the constituent assembly, but his ideas on eliminating inequality were spelt out in his magazine, The Young Indian, as early as 1931. Dr. Ambedkar was another visionary who led a campaign to eliminate inequality, even though his ideas differed from Mahatma Gandhi on how this should be tackled, although the basic principles were agreed upon. The Constitution of India is a living document that undergoes amendments. Just as any book has a preface, similarly every constitution has a preamble which shows exactly what the constitution aims at. It is the introductory part of the Constitution. The preamble begins with, We, the people of India. This signifies that the power is vested in the hands of the people. The preamble to the Indian Constitution lays emphasis on the ideals of sovereignty, socialism, secularism and a democratic republic.
A nation is sovereign when it is free in its internal matters from any foreign interference and its external policies are guided by its own interests. Socialism emphasizes the equitable distribution of national income to all sections of people. By secular, we mean that all religions have equal respect. Democratic means that people have the right to elect their representatives. And we are a republic as the head of state is an elected person with no hereditary right. The Constitution envisions social, economic and political justice for all citizens of the country. It ensures all liberties necessary for the individual, such as the freedom of thought and expression, faith, belief and of worship. It also strives for equality of opportunity and status and safeguard dignity. And it promotes a sense of fraternity or brotherhood. The unity and integrity of the nation can be seen as the hallmark of the efforts of the government. The constitution is very important in a democratic form of government. It delimits the scope of activity of various organs of the government. According to the Constitution, the government must work for the people and not misuse its powers. And so its powers are clearly defined in the Constitution. The rights granted to people are given prime importance. The Constitution is not merely a manuscript of historic value, but a living document that evolves according to the needs and aspirations of the people. Amendments to the Indian Constitution are of three categories. Amendments can be carried out by a simple majority of members being present and voting for it before forwarding it to the President for assent. Some amendments can only be carried out if two-thirds of the majority of the members are present and each of the houses have also voted. And for some amendments, not only do two-thirds of the majority of members need to be present in both houses, but also an approval of 50% of the state legislature is required before the amendment can be forwarded to the President.